want to welcome everyone who's watching online. We're glad you're hanging out with us today. Man, this is our last week of our Battle Ready series, but here's the thing I want to forewarn you. The series may end, but the battles do not. Amen? And so we got to be battle ready, ready even after this series ends today. And I was thinking about how to, how to kind of bring an ending to this, this series we're in, and I, was, I started thinking about like battle roars. That sounded like a kitten. You got to check your roar, my friend. But thank you for trying. Uh, no, no, but like, I was thinking like superheroes. And I was, anybody know this superhero? Cyborg. Do you know his battle roar? Booyah! Booyah! That's awesome. Who said that? Love it. That's awesome. You're, you're, fellow, you're a nerd like me. I love it. How about, how about, how about the thing? It's clobbering time. All right, how about uh, in honor of the movie that just came out, right? That's the old school Spider-Man. What was his battle roar? It was a... <laughs> that sounds like a dog going to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, my spidey senses are tingling. That's it. Which, by the way, does make you want to go to the bathroom, right? I always wondered about that when it just never sounded too, too, too much like a roar. Um, how about this one? Cowabunga. Cow Everyone knows Michelangelo. But I think the, the greatest roar that I personally, in all my 31 years of life, um, <laughs> was witnessed was back in 1995 with Sir William Wallace. Check it out. Against that? No! We will run! And we will live. Die. Fight and you may die. Run and you'll live. At least a while. I'm dying in your beds many years from now. Would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! Does that make you just want to get up and, and fight the enemy? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just me, sorry. But like, it makes me want to fight. I love it. But I think if we were honest today, do our roars sound like that? I think, I think sometimes our roars maybe sound more like a, a whimper or maybe a whine instead of freedom! I think sometimes it's victim. And here's the problem, is that both of those two roars, albeit totally different, are both equally as powerful and equally decisive or determinative in determining the outcome of the battle you and I face. Here's, here's what I'm saying. The roar you raise in the midst of the battle you face will determine whether you stand in victory or wallow in defeat. It all comes down to the roar you raise. I wanna talk about today, the roar you raise. We got a roar up inside of us, but it could be a victorious roar or it could be a a little, little whine, a little whimper to God. And I pray that we would be men and women of God who raise this godly roar in the midst of whatever we face. Exodus chapter 17, meet me there. The Israelites had, uh, had left Egypt en route for the promised land. But maybe if you've lived life for more than about three years, you know that sometimes God is taking you to a promised land, but you have to go through a problemed land. Who am I preaching to today? You, you with me? Okay, good, 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 good. The real Christians are like, yeah, that's me. No, I mean, I'm just saying, like, 
life is hard, right? God takes us to the promised land, but he, he takes us through the problem land. I'm not talking about self-induced problems when we're being stupid. I'm talking about God-ordained problems that he allows on the path to the promised land, amen? And so they were on their way to the, the promised land, and they ran into a big problem, and the problem was the Amalekite people. The Amalekite people were nomadic people, even though they didn't, you know, they, they would travel around, but they didn't like the Israelites, and they didn't like the Israelites coming through their territory. And so they would attack them. They, you know, they step into freedom only to be attacked by these Amalekites. Exodus 17, verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. As Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Two completely different roars. The battle is going to be impacted, actually determined by which roar is the loudest. When Moses' hands grew tired as they took a stone and put it under him and, and he sat on it, Aaron and Hur held, up his, held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this down on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. Remember that. Remember that. The Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Lord God, thank you for the way in which you fight our battles, the way in which you defend the people you love. God, help us raise a roar in the midst of the battles we face that would please you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Moses is 80 years old. He's in his 80s, early 80s. He's an old man. And so he, we, this is the first time we hear about Joshua in Scripture, by the way. So he says, Joshua, you're young. You're, you, can, you can fight. You go. Go. Fight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my walker and go up the hill. And so old Moses with, 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 with Aaron and her, they go up the hill. Now, the battle field that day heard a lot of roaring. Unquestionably, there was a lot of roars that went out. But let me submit to you that the greatest roar that day came from an 80-year-old, crusty old man up on the hill, lifting his hands to the Most High God. Now, see, in, in, in Scripture, whenever you see hands raised, it's almost always associated with prayer. So we know Moses would have been praying to God, interceding on behalf of his people. God, help us. We need your help. Here's what I'm trying to say. Your roar is your worship. Your roar, your God-given roar that lives inside of you and quite frankly, sometimes is dormant. Can we be real? Like sometimes it's just like a little kitten in there, like meow, like someone just roared over there. Like that's, yeah, that's you. I, I, I feel you. But, the, but like, you know, that's, it, it ain't supposed to be like that. Maybe, maybe something's happened to you. Maybe, maybe, you know, you've been hurt. You've been burnt. I don't know what it is, but like that ain't the roar God gave you. That's the roar we, through issues, have developed. But that's not the God-given roar. There's a God-given megaphone, a microphone, a PA system inside of you meant to come out, meant to worship God, not when everything's perfect, in the midst of things going bad, right? Not just on the other side of a problem, but in the midst of a problem. And it's meant to come out, and don't you know Satan wants to steal it? He wants to steal your roar. How do I know? What's the first thing after Jesus got baptized, came out the Jordan River, dripping wet still, goes into the desert. After 40 days of no food, enemy comes to him, and what does he say? Bow down. Give me your worship. 
I'll give you everything if you give me the one thing I want from you, Jesus, your worship. And don't you know the enemy is trying to sucker punch us the same exact way. He wants to rob you and I of our worship. He wants to steal our worship. You don't believe me? It happened last week on this stage, 9 a.m. Y'all weren't here at 9 a.m. Some of you were, but so you missed it. But at 9 a.m., Mo and Jamie's son was up here, right back here, playing guitar. I look back and he's like, so I go back and he's like, I don't have, I don't have signal. They lost the signal for his guitar, okay? And it wasn't anything that our team did, thank God. It was, it was a pedal board issue that he had, his pedal board, and his, had something go wrong and he lost the signal. So you know what he did? He, he got up in a little, the fetal position, curled up and whined like a baby. <laughs> That's not what he did. This young 19-year-old man was an example for the rest of us to see. I look back there, him, the whole worship set, the whole time, he's back there just strumming that guitar, knowing full well it ain't coming to the PA, it ain't coming through the speakers. He's just worshiping his heart out, letting that roar just emanate from his hands. And, 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 yeah, and, and here's the cool thing. Do you think it's any less meaningful to God because, because it didn't come through the PA and y'all didn't hear it? You think God needs a hearing aid? You think God needs those speakers to hear worship? I would submit that it meant more to God. That he passed the test and worship through it. And that's the, that's the, that's the word for some of us. You're, you're in the midst of it. Your roar is being minimized. It's being squelched a bit. And, and God's saying worship through it. Worship through it. Oh, but if I just get through the problem. No, no, no. If you, if you wait to worship till you're through the problem, you miss the power of the problem and what he wants to produce in the problem. We gotta worship through it. You gotta praise through it. And, and, and check this out. This is, this is so cool how God, he, he's, he's, he's a genius. Well, he is a genius, literally. But how he puts little nuggets in there. If you wanna go deeper, I wanna go deeper, Pastor John. Well, don't rely on your pastor for all that. Like, you can go deeper, right, at home. Right? You, this, you're, you're a pastor of your own house, right? And so when you read the word and you're a student of the word, you'll, you'll start to dissect things and ask good questions. So, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Wait a second, well, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I thought when he raised his hands, they won. When he lowered his hands, they lost. But he says they overcame him, they overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So what do we ask? Good questions. Which sword? We talking about a sword of steel? Because it didn't look like that sword of steel was doing too hot when, when their hands were lowered. The sword wasn't doing so. Or is he talking about the sword of the Spirit? Ephesians chapter 6. Remember we've been talking about these, this spiritual armor that God has given us? We talked about, last week, Pastor Michael talked about the helmet of salvation. The, we've talked about the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith. And lastly, the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Do you know what a weapon you have, the power you have, but we so often don't use our sword. We so often, we just kinda, you know, try to defend ourselves when we have a sword to do it. People say, oh, Pastor John, I, don't, I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Really? Oh, that's good because you don't have to know what to say. Because God gave us a pre-planned roar called the sword of the spirit. When people come after you, you're not good enough. Really? Because the sword says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, you, well, but yeah, my, my, I whisper, you know, the enemy whispers, you, you know, you can't do it. I can do all, th I can do all things. Or, or, or I'm afraid, well, God has not given me the spirit of fear. Like I, 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 we, have a, we have a built-in defense called the sword of the spirit. And not only that, it's an offensive weapon as well. It's a defensive weapon to defend. We got pre-planned war, but we also have an offensive weapon. What do I mean? 2 Corinthians 10.4. We use the sword of the spirit to demolish strongholds. Anybody have any 
issues? Don't act like that crying baby is the only issue in your life. We love kids and we love babies. But don't act like that's the biggest thing you're facing. I, I wish it was. I wish it was, but we're facing issues. We got, we got challenges in our life. Can we just be real and, 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 act, and stop acting like our families are, everything's perfect, everything's great, I'm just going to church. I go to church, so I love Jesus, so of course. It, no, no, we, we face a real enemy, and we have real battles that we fight, and we gotta use this, this, this offensive weapon. But think about an offensive weapon. That offensive weapon can sometimes be offensive. Now, I'm not suggesting we, you know, use the word to, 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 to bludgeon people. You know, some of you have been to churches where they just, just tear you apart with the word of God. God never meant it for it to be that. But, 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 but speaking the truth in love, even when you speak it in love, sometimes people get butthurt. You know what? You, see, some of you are butthurt because they use the word butthurt. <laughs> I'm telling you. Y'all got to pray for your pastor. But here's the thing. Life is a battle of the roars. Your life, my life, is a battle of roars. You don't believe me? You don't believe that, that the enemy is roaring for you? Prowling like a roaring lion, the Bible says? You don't, you don't believe me? You don't believe that the enemy's prowling for our children? You don't believe that? Just go to Target. I'm just, just saying, like, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm, I, I love, I, Nothing wrong with the store. I'm just saying, like, you know, we have a real, real enemy who's prowling like a lion and coming after us. And, and, and you know, I hear people saying, well, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid. And by the way, and by the way, let me be clear with Scripture. Everything we preach is from the Bible, okay? So the world will tell you you have to affirm. And if you don't affirm, you're, you hate. Okay? Now, hang on, hang on. That's biblically. I don't, you don't care about my opinion. Quite frankly, I, I don't probably care about yours. I, I love you. 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 But, but what I'm saying is, what does the Bible say? It says we, we love sinners, so, but we don't aff- affirm sin. Where, so, so you say, well, where, where do you stand, Pastor John? Where do I stand? I stand with Jesus, right? But, but be careful, because standing with Jesus, yes, He's clear as to what sin is, but he's also clear about loving people. Do you know that, do you know that we've, just this past gathering, we had, we had, a, well, we had a, um, over the past actually two and a half years, there's someone that Pastor Michael and I met with who was in a gay marriage. She left her spouse, has been healed and living in victory, um, Last I heard, she was dating a guy. Here's my point. There is freedom, there is victory. And, and let's not be the church that beats up people who sin differently than us. We know where we stand on the issue, but, but don't you dare. We will not be a church that bludgeons people. If you're struggling with sexual sin or any other sin, like many of us are, whatever that sin may be, because we're sinners, right? Saved by grace. We welcome you. This is a spiritual hospital. We want you to feel loved. We want you to feel welcome. Yes, we're not going to acquiesce or change the Bible. I'm not going to get out my little red pen and say, well, I don't like that part, Jesus. I'm going to change it. No, no, we don't do that. But we love broken and hurting and messed up people. Why? Because we're all a little bit broken, hurting, and messed up, and we need Jesus. And God will heal heal us in time. Amen? (laughs) But so so the the number one song on iTunes this week was Boycott Target. You heard that? It was, it's, a, it's a rap song by a conservative rapper, and uh, it's called Boycott Target. And here's the thing. We have to be careful. I, I, so I'm not saying we shouldn't boy, boycott Target. The, 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 the Bible says, you know, Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do with darkness. But don't stop there, right? Because Christians, we're, we're known for saying what we're against instead of declaring what we're for. What are we for? We're for people who need Jesus, people who are broken, people who, who need hope, right? And, and, and so... If you want to, I, I probably, I may not shop at Target, but, but that doesn't mean I'm going to avoid the darkness. Hang on, hang on, hear, hear me out. Here's, here's why, here's what I'm saying. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, let light shine out of darkness. We live in a dark world and that ain't going to change. 
but we are lights in a dark world. And if that means intersecting with a place you don't wanna go or people you may not wanna see it, it, through the path of obedience, if it means that, then, then, then I will go wherever God tells me to go to reach the people needed reached, right? Now, if it's, if it's not a God-ordained mission, I probably ain't gonna shop there. But listen, don't just tell them, just, just don't, don't, let, don't let people know what, just what we're against. Let's let them know who we are for, Amen. So the worship we have, that roar, it wins battles. How do I know? We just read about it. What was the determining factor? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this striking young man, come on up here. Right here, yeah, yeah, you. Oh, he's getting nervous. It's your first time? I have a knack of doing that. Oh, dang it. Oh. Anybody else this first time who, who thoroughly wants me to defend them as if I haven't done so? What's your name? Mickey. Mickey? Yeah, I'm from Austria. From Austria? Ah, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I, I was going to say something that, that, that ma it's made in Austria that I like, but I don't want to because I, I, I don't want to be offensive for the sake of being offensive. Um, Austria, they make some very good things that I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. Um, um, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, let's see, I need, Cam, Cam, come on up here. I know, I know that you, you would have already left if you were easily offended. And so, tell me your name one more time. Mickey. Mickey. Mm -hmm. All right. So, here's, Mickey, you on this side. Cam, you're on this side. All right. And so, here we go. So, put that scripture up, if you would. Thank you. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, Amalekites won. The problem is, he's 80-some years old, he's old, he's tired, and if you hold your hands up over your head, you get... I'm just agreeing. Okay, you know what? I wasn't going to say anything about the newspaper hat, <laughs> but... Okay, there you go. And that's... All right, there anyways. So, he, low, he would lower his hands, and they would lose, Right? Raise him up, he's good. What, what was the determining factor for the outcome of the battle? The level of the hands, right? So, so hang on, so I'm tired, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm 31 years old and I'm getting tired, <laughs> all right? And, 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 and what happens? And all, they see, uh-oh, we're losing, we're losing, we're losing. So what do you do, what do you do? Raise him back up. Raise him back up. Now, okay, good. The last service, like someone had one of my hands really high and the other, I'm like, okay. Okay, so we ask good questions. The questions I would ask, and maybe you're asking is, who do you have in your life that would raise up your hands when you're weary? <laughs> Amen? Because we all need an Aaron and a her. You are the her. Okay? With that, with that nice man beard of yours. You're Aaron and her. We need them in their life. And, and I would ask another question. Who needs you in their life to raise up their hands at work, at, at, at the gym, wherever you, whatever your circle is, whoever it is, maybe is in your family, right? So good questions. Another question you might ask is, and by the way, if, if, if you don't have someone in your life, Sign up for a, one of our small groups. That's how we live out. I got, I got Mo back there, big Mo. I should have got you up here, Mo, but I know you would leave the church. So I'm just kidding. But, but we need people in our lives, right? But, but what else is important? Important maybe to ask how high? How high is high enough level to win the battle that you're facing? Right? I mean, because I'm sitting there thinking, like, is this, hang on, because I'm starting to get a little, my spidey senses are tingling. <laughs> okay. I mean, you do get tired, right? Like, keeping it real. Too tight for you? Huh? My grip too Your tight? grip too tight. Here we go with the grip thing. Gosh. <laughs> Pride cometh before a falleth. All right. All right, here we go. So, so how high? It's high enough. What level is high enough? to win your battle? Answer, the level, based on scripture today, must be greater 
than your devil. Ooh, whatever devil you face, your praise, your roar better be just a little bit greater than his because he's coming for you. He's coming for us. That's just the life. And so we got to raise it to a, a whole nother level, right? Amen. Thank you. You can, you can go because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, Mickey, Mi, yeah. what's her name again? Mickey. I just like hearing him saying that if it's Australia now. Say, say it in the mic real quick. Mickey. Can you say, I love this church? I love this church. Oh, it's so good. Why does that just sound so cool? Dang it. I wish we could. Uh, that's, I'm going to preach about coveting next week. No. So don't, parents, you know what I'm talking about when, when I say we got to raise our, our roar to the level, uh, greater than the level of our devil, right? Because parents, you know what I'm talking about. Like when, when, when and you, how many kids you guys have? Eight. He knows. And so when I was, when my kids were, when they were young, can, can you get on your knees real, just real quick? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not going to be mean, I promise. But we, we trained our kids when they were little to do, to put their hand on the hip. Will you put the hand on the hip? Thanks. They did that when we were talking. <laughs> you are one sick man. <laughs> no, I love Kim. Kim's, they've been with us since the beginning. And she's, she's got all this on social media. Look at her. She's over there filming it. We had a godly wife. I love it. I am in a, yeah. So, so anyways, we would, we, would, we would train them up. Oh, come on. We would train them up. And, and, and back in the day, like, our roar was so simple. It was so concise. It was so confident and so clear. Because after all, we were great parents. I mean, we would, we would talk with people and their, their little devils would be running around and ours would be like little compliant soldiers, you know, with their, and, I'd be like, and I'd just sit there and, you know, ramble and ramble and ramble and ramble to try to, you know, <laughs> and I'd be like Dr. Phil, I'd give them all sorts of advice, right? Now, stand up, now they're older and, and they're back there, they're sitting back there. And, and, and let me just be clear, I got great kids, I'm super grateful and thankful. Uh, so this is not a knock on my kids at all, but they get older and, and they have to go there own way, find their own way. They have to find, they can't f find John's Jesus. They have to find their Jesus, right? And they have to, you, my faith can't be their faith. We can influence it. We can impact them, but they got to, and so the, the, the little hand, you know, it's, it, sometimes if, as parents, if we're honest, it feels more like a stiff arm. Give me a stiff arm. There you go. Right? Who am I preaching to today? Where are the Christians at? Okay. All right. All right. Sometimes as parents, it feels a little more like a stiff arm. Not because you're bad parents. Now the enemy will tell you you're a bad parent. That's why you have to pull out the sword and defend that, right? But sometimes it feels like that. What do we do? We elevate our praise. We take our praise greater than the level of our devil. We cry out in desperation, in, 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 in dependency. We cry out and raise our roar. God, I can't raise kids. I can't do this apart from you. As, oppo as opposed to, as opposed to, I got this all figured out. Look at the little hand on my side. No, no. Like, God's got me right, he's got us right where he wants us. Why? Because we're dependent on the most high God. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Give him praise. See, and, and a lot of us, we, ref we refuse to fight battles, and here's why. Because, oof, I wish I could preach easier stuff. The truth is kind of hard, right? Um, bondage has benefits. Right? Bondage has benefits. There's, I mean, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. So there, there's, there, the bondage has benefits. What do I mean? The Israelites spent 400, roughly 400 years in Egyptian slavery. You know how many battles the Bible records them fighting while in Egyptian slavery during those 400 years? You know how many? Zero. And yet, the moment they cross over the Red Sea, when the seas parted, and they stepped into freedom, they had an enemy. The Amalekites waiting for them with a sword. Bondage has benefits. You do something for God, you do something for Jesus, you're gonna have an enemy. And here's what I wanna tell you. You can't have the blessings without the battles. We want blessings, 
And blessings are coming, but you can't have the blessings without the battles. Some of you are battling something and you're bemoaning the very blessing that God has given you in the midst of the battle because you're mad at God because you're going through a battle. And he's like, no, that's the process. That's the, the avenue through which I wanna bless you, but you're mad because you're in a battle. Be careful. Don't bemoan the blessing God's trying to send you. You can't have the blessings without the battles. What, what happened to the Egypt, the uh, Israelites? Remember they started whining? <sighs> Oh, this freedom thing sucks. Take us back, Moses. Did you bring us out here to die? They started whining. They wanted to go back. Here's what I want to say. You cannot beg God to heal you and stay loyal to what's killing you. Amen? That bondage was killing them. And God sets them into freedom. But because they faced the battle... They thought something was wrong. And God says, no, no, there's nothing wrong. This battle was a God-induced battle to bless you, but you gotta believe that. You can't have the blessings without the battles. You know, for, for five years as a church, we've been battling to try to find a student pastor. Five years. A church of an average attendance on a weekend, about 1,800 people. It's odd and unusual for a church of our size not to have a student pastor. But as we prayed and as we would seek God, the doors would close and we, we just couldn't find the right person. Well, that battle went on and on and on for five years. Well, friends, that battle will be fought no more. Today, yes. Today, I'm super excited. Cindy, come on up. I'm super excited to announce to you, after many years of searching, um, we have uh, just recently made the decision to bring on our team, Pastor Russell and his lovely wife, Mary Frances, and Maggie Jo, sweet little Maggie Jo with the blue eyes who was smiling at me. Would you welcome them? Come on over. And... Just a few things, just a few things. I'm gonna let him share just a, a quick moment, but he, he went to Bible college in Kansas and they've been married for four years, just had this beautiful little girl in what, in January, right? Yeah. Four months. So he's, he's a new parent, so pray for him. But, <laughs> but God, man, I'm telling you, this is a big deal for our church. This is a big deal for our church. And, and we're sending off, one, to go be a student, you're going family ministry in, in Florida. Where's, when, you, when you leave? January 19th. January 19th. Oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry. June 19th. June 19th. Yeah, I was going to say. And so, Quavion, we're going to miss you, brother. And, but, but see, that's how this whole kingdom thing works. God brings someone in, and you build up others, and you send them out. And you're going to do great, and we're going to follow you, and we're super excited for you. But today's not your day. <laughs> so... This is a big deal. This is a big deal for us. He is a great leader. Um, he's been at the church he's at for four years and done an incredible job. Uh, and we are thankful for that. Yeah, he, he's not one of those guys that just bounces around the church to church. He's super faithful, got super high character. And I just, we are so excited to, to have you on the team. So share a few thoughts. Yeah, well, he's making it seem like we're all that in a bag of chips, which we kind of are. She is, I'm not, but uh, thank you for that. We're really honored and humbled to be able to serve the Lord alongside you guys here at the gathering. We're excited about what uh, you guys are doing, and we can't wait to jump in and join with you guys. Uh, like you said, I've been at a church in West Peoria for about four years now, and kind of the heartbeat of my life that my dad kind of spoke over me was Luke 2.52. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. And kind of what you see is you see Jesus coming back to his parents when he's in the temple at the age of 13. And then we don't see him again until he's 30 starting his mm. ministry. And so something happened in those 17 years. Yeah. And the reality is Jesus grew. He grew in wisdom mentally. He grew in stature physically. He grew in relationship with others relationally. And he grew in relationship with God spiritually. Mm. And so that's what we want to be all about. We want to be growing spiritually. We want to be growing relationally, mentally, physically. Obviously, the physically thing is something I'm still working on. Uh, one of the things that John said that I had to do as part of the staff now is I have to get to the point where I can bench 250. That's not true. That's not true. That just look at this guy. True. I'm still getting there. My arms wouldn't be held up for that long. I would need a lot more help. 
awesome. but we're really excited to be here. Um, so that's just the heartbeat. We can all grow in every season of our life, no matter we're old like John or young like me. We can be growing. He's going to do great. We can be growing. He'll fit right in. He'll but, fit right in. That's what we're about. We're about loving people. We're about making you feel welcome, known, and seen in our student ministry and, and growing just like Jesus did. So thank you, guys. Yes. Give God praise for this awesome couple. We love you guys. Woo! Love you guys. And the cool thing is, and by the way, they'll be in the lobby if, they want to, if you want to meet them. I encourage you to meet them. But the cool thing is the name's really easy to remember because it's Russell Wilson. Right? <laughs> And he's probably a better quarterback than the Russell Wilson. I'm sorry, ex-Seattle fans. But, um, so so two, million, uh, two million Israelites, think about this. this, this they, they cross over the, the Red Sea. Two million Israelites with these women and, and children. They're bricklayers. They're unexperienced. They're untested. They're undeveloped. They are not like a formidable fighting force, right? Like they're just a bunch of bricklayers trying to escape Slavery. And yet they're about to face this massive army whose civilization de depends on their uh, proficiency with the sword. And so how is it that this untrained, unskilled force can somehow be victorious over the Amalekite army? The answer is not what was, or not who was on the battlefield, but rather who was over the battlefield. What do I mean? Verse 15, Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. In Hebrew, that would be transliterated Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi, fight my battles, right? Jehovah Nisi was the banner. They flew. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Well, wait a second. I thought the Amalekites were fighting the Israelites. But it says, the Lord will be at war again. Were, were the Amalekites fighting the Israelites or were they fighting the Lord? The answer to that question depends on which banner the Israelites were flying. Were they flying their own banner? No. They were flying the banner of our Lord. Jehovah Nisi was flying over that battlefield, which is why they had air support. Before there was F-35s, there was Jehovah Nisi fighting the battles. And so when you march onto your battlefield and you're about to leave into your mission field, which also happens to be your battlefield, they're synonymous. When you walk out into your battlefield, your fate will be determined largely by the banner you fly. Let me say it a little simpler. Conquest is determined by covering. Conquest or victory is determined by covering. And so I have to ask, what's your covering? Is it Jehovah Nisi or is it Facebook? A lot of us, we would rather go online to deal with our battles. I can't believe my ex, blah, blah, blah. I'm so glad my new spouse treats me so much better, right? Uh, they, you'd rather go online than get in line under the banner of Jehovah Nisi. Be careful, right? Be careful, come on. Or, or, or maybe for, for, for some of us, if we're honest, our, our, our banner is a substance because we'd rather run to, to Jack Daniels than to Jesus Christ. What's our banner? For, for some people, it's self-righteousness, and this one drives me nuts. It's, it's, the, it's the people who are like, Self-righteous to help themselves feel better. I won't forgive that person who hurt me. I'll forgive everyone else, but not that jack wagon as if I don't need grace and you don't need the grace of God and mercy of God. Or, 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 or for, for a lot of us, I think our, our banner could be the affirmation of others. Anybody 
fight that battle? I do. I'll keep it real. I fought that battle this week. I was in, I was in, the, I was in the gym, and I was leg day. I looked down. I'm like, man. I really, this is, I, the protein, I've been eating good protein. I guess it's working out for me. I felt like, you know, I felt like I was making some, some gains in a good way. And then I realized the shorts that I was wearing, they weren't my shorts. My lovely wife, who does my laundry, which I'm grateful for, Okay, I'm grateful for that because there was a season when she was working and I had to do my laundry and I, it was not a good thing. But, but she switched Levi's shorts with my shorts. He wears small, I wear mediums. And, and, and so I'm like, and then everyone's looking at me and thinking, oh, they're, they're looking at these legs, huh? I got, I got Leon legs, you know? He, he was in the last service, but he's got some big old legs. I thought they were looking, no. I think they were looking at the fact that the pockets of the shorts came below the shorts, like some of the girls' shorts, you know, like the Daisy Dukes or whatever. I was wearing Daisy Dukes to the gym. And so I'm like freaking out, having this existential crisis about these shorts and people, what they think of me. And I'm like, what, what does it matter? What, does it really matter? What they think about my shorts? I mean, maybe some, because maybe some people will be grossed out and not come to the church. So I mean, but isn't it funny how sometimes God removes a physical covering to expose our spiritual nakedness. Sometimes that's a good thing. Here's what I want. Here's what I want to encourage you to do today. I want to encourage you. Come on out. Thank you, Shane. I want to encourage you huh, to stand firm under the banner of Jesus, under the banner of Jehovah Nisi. I want you to fight your battles under that banner and you watch how the battle changes. Some of you, you've been fighting it in your own strength. Some of you have been doing it, trying to do this in, in your own flesh and it's not working out. It's because your banner ain't his banner. His banner is victorious. His record, he's undefeated. He never lost a battle. Here's the thing. We all talk about the armor of God, and we should. Ephesians 6. But don't forget, don't miss what comes before that verse that we all talk about. I'll read it for you. Verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In other words, and it goes on to say, put on the full armor of God, but... Put on the full armor of God, not in your own strength, not under your own power or your own might, but under the banner of Jesus Christ, under the banner of Jehovah Nisi, who's never lost a battle. You put on that armor, you stand, you stand firm, and you fight knowing that you're waving the banner of Christ over the battle. And that through his strength, not your own, you will be victorious, and only through his strength. Friends, Paul wrote the whole thing in Ephesians 6. We all talk about it, right? We all talk about the power of, of, of the armor of God. Do you know where he wrote that? You know where he wrote that? He wrote that in, thank you. He wrote it in prison. He wrote it in prison. And you know what? If you read the rest of the passages, no one ever does because they stop at the flashy part. They stop at the cool part. Put on the armor of God. That's cool. That preaches well. Yes, it does. And that's awesome. And do it. But don't stop there. Because if you read on, in that same passage, he says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare fearlessly as I should. In other words, when all hell comes against you, and it will, when things, are, when, when you experience persecution or problems or pain, when, when your own family turns against you, it's happened, right? It's a thing. I pray that I would raise up a God honoring roar under the banner of Christ. I pray that I would not grow weary of doing good that I could raise up a roar that would be pleasing unto you, O righteous God. 
You have circumstances you face. Don't let your circumstances dictate your call. The Bible says your call is irrevocable. Some of you, you're experiencing trouble. Don't let trouble steal your treasure. The Bible tells us that we have treasures in earthly vessels. There's a, there's a treasure inside of you called your roar that needs to get out to a world that's dark and needs to see the light of Jesus Christ. Some of us, we have problems. Don't let your problems overwhelm your purpose. But what's my purpose? I'll give you your purpose in one verse. Isaiah 43, 21. This is why you woke up this morning. This is why God's choosing to allow you to breathe right now. The people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. If you're wondering why you exist, why you're breathing in and breathing out, why that ticker's still ticking, is because you exist to glorify the most high God, to lift up a God-honoring roar, regardless of what you face, regardless of what you're going through, to cry out to God and let a roar that reaches him in heaven and gives him God bumps all over because of what you're going through. Because your signal was lost. You worship through it. Your kids ain't perfect. They give you the stiff arm. You worship through it. Here's my sermon of the sins, and I'm done. The roar you raise under the banner you fly within the battles you face will determine whether you stand in victory or wallow in defeat. I pray that this house, this covering, would be a, would be a house of men and women of God who cry out to God, who roar and let that roar please and honor a God who is intimately involved in every detail of our life, who cares desperately more than you ever know for you. I pray that we would raise up roars that reach our God and that put a smile on his face. It all comes down to the roar you raise. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, thank you for being with us today and leading us. Holy Spirit, we feel your presence in this place. We know you're real, and we know you love us. God, forgive us for our mistakes. Forgive us for our, sometimes our, our roar that maybe isn't the most God-honoring roar. Forgive me for when I've whined instead of roared. But Lord, we just thank you for who you are and the plan you have for our life. We thank you that you are doing great things in us and through us, and you are raising up men and women with a voice, and release that voice into a greater area of, of, of ministry, into purpose. Release that voice, God. Help us grow in that voice and the stewardship of that voice. And help us speak loudly to a world that is hard of hearing but needs to hear truth. Help us do it in a way that is loving and God-honoring. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're watching online or you're here today, you don't know Jesus. The greatest roar you could ever raise is the roar to accept Jesus as your God, to make him your king, to know that you will go to eternity and, and live forever with the king of all kings. If that's you today and you, do, you wanna know Jesus, you wanna make him your Lord, just with every head bowed, every eye closed, just, just pray something like this. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life and I believe that you are the king of kings and that you did die on that cross for me. Lord, I wanna roar. I wanna be your child who roars. So today, I ask you to be my God. From this moment forward, I exist for you. For you, Jesus, are my King. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just welcome them people in the family of God? Come on. That's awesome. Woo. 
That's awesome. If you made that decision, stop our little connect counter on the way out. We got a little free gift we wanna give you. And listen, if you're going through something and you are, we are going through things, we have our pastors, our prayer team, our elders. We'd love to pray with you up here. We do life better when we do it together. So I just encourage you to stop there and, and receive prayer as, as the Lord would lead you. For the rest of us, you're about to go out in your battlefield, put a smile on your face, and raise a God-honoring roar. God is in control. Amen? God bless you. Love you.